Proposition 8 that uh, the parties had no standing, clearing the way for California to uh, legalize same-sex marriage and let those marriages continue. The House is about to come back into session for legislative business. Members taking up rules for debate on three bills, two on offshore oil and gas drilling, and one uh, with uh, funding the Agriculture Department for 2014. Uh, meanwhile, our live coverage of reaction to the Supreme Court continuing on C-SPAN 3, House Republican Study Committee headed by conservative Republican Steve Scalise scheduled a briefing for 1215, and uh, we will have that coverage for you continuing live on C-SPAN 3. Now live coverage of the House here on C-SPAN. The House will be in order. Prayer will be offered today by our guest chaplain, Reverend Michael Rucker, from the Bible Baptist Church, Wichita Falls, Texas. Thank you, Speaker. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we come into your presence and thank you for all that you've done for this country. We would ask your leadership in the decisions that need to be made to keep this country great. Help us to put aside our personal feelings and do what is right for the great nation and the people of this nation. Lord, we would ask you to help all the states that have had catastrophes the past few months continue to heal and restore back the things that have been lost or destroyed in these events. We're so thankful for your watch care over us. Keep us free from the tyranny of those who want to take our freedom away. Watch over our men and women in the military. We appreciate the liberty you have so graciously blessed us with. And we want to give you all the praise and the honor and the glory. And we thank you for it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. The chair has examined the journal of the last day's proceedings and announces to the House his approval thereof. Pursuant to Clause 1 of Rule 1, the journal stands approved. Pledge of Allegiance today will be led by the gentleman from Pennsylvania, Mr. Thompson. To the flag. Without objection, the gentleman from Texas, Mr. Thornberry, is recognized for one minute. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, our guest chaplain today has been the pastor of Bible Baptist Church in Wichita Falls, Texas, for the past 20 years. But his ministry and passion for spreading the Word of God has never been confined to the walls of any church building. Mike Rucker, known to many as the Flying Preacher, has been combining his love of auto racing and the ministry since 1985, when he and his wife of 40 years, Cherie, began Rucker Racing Ministries. Since then, they have traveled to racetracks across the United States, spreading the good word while he races, and Cherie often sings the national anthem. Pastor Rucker also serves as the chaplain for the Wichita County Sheriff's Office and for the Wichita Falls Police Department and is a regular on the Joe Tom White Rise and Shine radio show. In short, he has never been afraid to roll up his sleeves and be in the world while sharing the gospel with folks across Texas and the nation. Pastor Rucker graduated from the Arlington Baptist College in Arlington, Texas. He and Cherie have two sons, Michael and Matthew, and one daughter, Marlene, and five grandchildren. I'm pleased to help welcome Pastor Rucker, the flying preacher, to the house today. I yield back. Gentlemen, yields back his time. The chair will entertain 15 further requests for one-minute speeches on each side of the aisle. What purpose does a gentlelady from Kansas seek recognition? The gentlelady asks for unanimous consent. Does I the gentlelady ask for unanimous consent? Yes. The gentlelady is recognized for one minute. Thank you. Uh, yesterday, the president called for more energy taxes and regulation that will hurt the economy and job creation. One of the president's senior advisors even said, a war on coal is exactly what's needed. In my state, where coal supplies nearly 75 percent of the electricity and coal plants support thousands of jobs, I don't think a war on coal is what Kansans need. Reducing one of the most affordable sources of energy will cause prices to go up, and that makes life harder 
for people. The administration needs to stop picking winners and losers. This approach has failed. It cost taxpayers billions of dollars and dozens of green energy companies that were offered taxpayer dollars are bankrupt or faltering and laying off workers. Instead of favoring special interests, the House plan supports a real all of the above approach to energy that will incentivize job creation, lower energy costs for Americans, and reduce U.S. dependence on foreign oil. I re yield back. The gentlelady yields back her time. What purpose does the gentleman from Oregon seek recognition? Gentleman, gentleman from Oregon ask unanimous consent. Uh, no, I don't need to revise. Gentleman is recognized for one minute. Almost uh, 17 years uh, to the day, that's a long time, uh, the House of Representatives passed the so-called Defense of Marriage Act. At that time, I went to the floor and voted with a small minority against this legislation. I said it was unnecessary, discriminatory, and unconstitutional. Well, it took 17 years to work through the system and finally get the Supreme Court to act and decide that indeed the Defense of Marriage Act, so-called, is unconstitutional, a deprivation of the equal liberty of persons that's protected in the Fifth Amendment. They said, quote, the federal statute is invalid for no legitimate purpose, overcomes the purpose and effect to disparage and injure those whom the state, by its marriage laws, sought to protect in personhood and dignity, written by Justice Kennedy. By seeking to displace this protection and treating those persons, treating those persons as living in marriages less respected than others. Today, the Supreme Court restored justice and equity in America. The gentleman's time has expired. What purpose does the gentleman from Pennsylvania seek recognition? The gentleman from Pennsylvania is recognized for one minute. Mr. Speaker, more than a month ago, the House passed H.R. 1911, a bill based on President's 2014 budget request that would provide a market-based interest rate for student loans. Editorial boards from across the country have lauded this bill and called on the Senate to act on a similar proposal. USA Today stated, and I quoted, rates on loans are now set by Washington, not markets. Obama and the House Republicans wisely call for a market solution. The Boston Globe stated, the solution President Obama and House Republicans have proposed would prevent what has become a frustrating annual standoff. The Los Angeles Times stated, Republicans are backing a long-term solution as similar to one President Obama proposed. The Senate should pass its own version and then work out the differences with the House. With less than a week before student loan rates jump from 3.4 to 6.8 percent, the Senate has failed to pass a bill that would address the issue. It's time for the Senate to come to the table. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I yield back. The gentleman yields back his time. What purpose does the gentleman from California seek recognition? I seek unanimous consent to address the House for one minute and to revise and extend my remarks. The gentleman is recognized for one minute. Canyon Middle School from Castro Valley, California, in my congressional district, was recently recognized as one of the schools to watch by the National Forum to Accelerate Middle Grades Reform. The School to Watch program was launched in 1999 to identify high-performing middle schools that serve as a model for other schools to watch across the nation. These schools, like Canyon Middle School, demonstrate academic excellence, develop programs to respond to the sensitive needs of early adolescents, and provide students with high-quality teachers and resources to support students in their academic goals. This week at the 9th Annual Schools to Watch Conference, Canyon Middle School will be presented with this prestigious award. Canyon Middle School will be represented by attendance clerk Adria Anderson Kelly, assistant principal Juan Flores, assistant principal Annie Flores Aki, math and science teacher Gregory Matarawan, math and science teacher Liz Odell, and special education teacher Cheryl Rosales. I look forward to congratulating the group from Canyon Middle School this Thursday when they visit my office and hearing more details about how more schools can follow their example of excellence. Congratulations again to the teachers, administrators, parents, and students that helped Canyon Middle School achieve this award. You make me and your congressional district very proud. Chairman yields back his time. What purpose does the gentleman from Arkansas seek recognition? Gentleman is recognized for one minute. Today, I honor the memory of my constituent, Steve LaFrance, who passed away earlier this month. Uh, Steve was a pillar of the Pine Bluff community, really of all of Arkansas. A pharmacist by training, he started his business in 1968 with a single pharmacy in Gibson's department store in Pine Bluff. 
From that modest start, Steve built USA Drug over 44 years into the largest privately owned chain of drugstores in the country. Steve's motto, like my own dad's, was do the right thing. It was the foundation of his success. All who knew him and all who worked with Steve, whether employees, customers, vendors, even competitors, respected not only his business acumen, but especially his sense of fair play, passion, and loyalty. Even more than a businessman, though, Steve was a devoted family man, proud father of four children and seven grandkids, and the loving husband of Linda, his wife of 44 years. He was also a deeply faithful Christian man who walked in the path of the Lord and now walks with him. On behalf of all Arkansans in the United States Congress, I wish to express my deepest condolences to them. Like you, we all miss Big Steve, and we were all enriched by having our lives touched by him. Gentleman yields back his time. What purpose does the gentleman from Georgia seek recognition? The House for up to one minute and revise and extend. The gentleman is recognized for one minute. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I rise to express my disappointment in the Supreme Court's decision striking down the preclearance provisions of the Voting Rights Act. Mr. Speaker, making sure that our election laws are fair is the most important job in a democracy because the right to vote is the right on which everything else depends. Countless Americans have marched for it, suffered for it, and shed their blood for it. In Georgia, one of the greatest proponents of the Voting Rights Act, our colleague, Congressman John Lewis, knows all too well the price has been paid to make sure that election laws are not only open, but fair to all concerned. We can't go back to the days when majorities can pass laws that limit or diminish the voting strength of minorities. I'm calling on my colleagues in Congress, Republicans and Democrats, not to let this issue die. We need to do what is right and ensure once and for all that folks aren't discriminated against at the ballot box. And with that, I yield back. The gentleman yields back his time. What purpose does the gentlelady from North Carolina seek recognition? I ask unanimous consent to address the House for one minute, Mr. Speaker. The gentlelady from North Carolina is recognized for one minute. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. House Republicans have a plan to create jobs, grow our economy, and secure our future for all Americans. And we're doing it by expanding opportunity, not expanding government. We're holding government accountable to the hardworking taxpayers of this country. We're reining in runaway Washington spending that's driving up our national debt. We're going to reform our tax code to make it fairer and simpler for all Americans. We are promoting an all of the above all American energy strategy that will create jobs, lower energy costs, and strengthen our national security. These are the common sense solutions that the American people deserve, Mr. Speaker. It's not fair that Washington Democrats keep offering up only more spending and political games. Real solutions to real problems. That's the House Republican commitment. I yield back. The gentlelady yields back her time. What purpose does the gentlelady from Illinois seek recognition? The gentlelady from Illinois is recognized for one minute. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I rise today on behalf of seven million students with subsidized student loans to urge my colleagues in Congress to come together to prevent student loan rates from doubling on July 1st. The cost of a college degree has increased by more than 1,000 percent in the last 30 years. Two-thirds of college seniors who graduated in 2011 had an average student loan debt of $26,000 per borrower. As the July 1st deadline approaches, America's total student loan debt already tops $1.1 trillion. We're a nation that invests in our future, and that means investing in our kids. Mounting student debt is handicapping a generation of graduates who already face a tough job market. This debt is forcing them to put off key milestones like buying a home and starting a family. This delay in the American dream will diminish our nation's economic development. Congress has come to the aid of our banks and worked to promote industry. Now it's time to step up for our students by preserving college affordability and keeping the American dream within reach. Let's stand together to keep federal student loan rates down. I urge my colleagues to act now. I yield back. Gentlelady's time has expired. What purpose does the gentlelady from Tennessee seek recognition? To address the House for one minute, revise and extend. Gentlelady is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I come to the floor to share a quote with my colleagues to make them aware of this. It is from Daniel Schrag. He is the White House advisor on climate change, and this was reported in the New York Times. And quite frankly, I find this quote baffling. Here it is. The one thing the president really needs to do now is to begin the process of shutting down the conventional coal plants. Politically, the White House is hesitant to say that we're having a 
war on coal. On the other hand, a war on coal is exactly what's needed, end quote. And that was Mr. Schrag, who is the White House advisor on climate change. Mr. Speaker, I highlight this with my colleagues in this House right now. Because a war on coal is a war on jobs, a war on jobs is a war on the American worker. I have never met anybody that wants to pay more for electric power generation, but the actions of this administration, the actions of the president choosing to circumvent Congress and implement these is costing us 500,000 jobs. I yield back the balance of my time. The gentlelady's time has expired. What purpose does the gentlelady from Hawaii seek recognition? Uh, the the gentlelady is recognized for one minute. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'm rising today to recognize Post-Traumatic Stress Awareness Day and so that we can honor our men and women in uniform who've so bravely served our nation. For them, when they come home, the battle doesn't end, which is why we must ensure that they are well served as they go through the transition from combat to civilian life. Research has shown that an estimated 18.5 percent or nearly one in five of our courageous veterans suffer from PTSD or depression. This number is likely artificially low because of a reluctance to report these conditions. Further, PTSD and other mental conditions can often lead to other serious psychological and physical health conditions. In Congress, we must ensure that we work with the Department of Veterans Affairs to address these issues as they face our veterans coming home. We owe it to them, these selfless servant leaders, and empower them so that they can be provided the seamless transition they need and empower them to continue their service to our communities here at home. Mr. Speaker, I yield back. The gentlelady yields back her time. What purpose does the gentleman from North Dakota seek recognition? The gentleman from North Dakota is recognized for one minute. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. A couple of weeks ago, our President announced his intention to unilaterally disarm our national defense by cutting back our nuclear deterrent. This week, he announced his intention to unilaterally disarm our entire economy by declaring war on coal. In my state of North Dakota, the coal industry employs over 17,000 highly paid workers that provide the lowest cost electricity to our retail customers anywhere in the country. They contribute $3.5 billion to our state's economy. And in case the President thinks that we need his EPA to keep our air clean, he should know that North Dakota meets all ambient air quality standards as prescribed by the EPA. And I will not sit idly by and watch this President steal the jobs and the hopes and dreams of my constituents nor will I sit idly by while he and his EPA impose their mediocrity on my state's excellent stewardship of our natural resources. North Dakota will not retreat from this war waged on us by our president. We must and we will fight back. Mr. Speaker, I yield back the balance of my time. Chairman yields back the, this time. What purpose does the gentleman from California seek recognition? Mr. Speaker, I would like to ask the consent to address the House floor for one minute. gentleman from California is recognized for one minute. Mr. Speaker, I rise today to recognize the contributions of Dilip Singh Sound, the first Indian American and the first Asian American to be elected to Congress. Along with 13 of my colleagues from California, I recently sent a letter asking Governor Jerry Brown to induct him into the California Hall of Fame. Sound was born in a small village in India, and much like my own parents, he immigrated to the United States in 1920 to attend college in California. He went on to serve his adopted country for three terms in Congress and was a trailblazer for human and civil rights. Congressman Sound's outstanding achievements and public service are an inspiration to generations of Asian Americans, Californians, and to all Americans. His portrait now hangs right outside this chamber as a reminder to us all of the values that he stood for, values of equality and opportunity. Now it's time that Congressman Dilip Singh Sound's contributions are recognized in his home state by enshrining him in California's Hall of Fame. I yield back. It was back his time. What purpose does the gentleman from Connecticut seek recognition? The gentleman from Connecticut is recognized for one minute. Mr. Speaker, this morning in striking down the Discriminatory Defense of Marriage Act, the Supreme Court stood for an idea that permeates this institution, that regardless 
of who you are, the color of your skin, your religion, or who you choose to love, the United States will not discriminate against you. Unfortunately, yesterday the Supreme Court went in exactly the wrong direction on an even more fundamental issue, that those of us who serve here, our laws, our president, our members of Congress, are elected by the people of the United States in a truly equal fashion. We acknowledge that progress has been made in those regions that historically discriminated against minorities, but we also acknowledge that the problem is still there. Justice Ginsburg's dissenting opinion has example after example of discrimination. For example, in 2004, Waller County, Texas, threatened to prosecute two black students after they announced their intention to run for office. Mr. Speaker, business should cease on this floor until we take up the Supreme Court's challenge to modernize and reinstitute the heart of the Voting Rights Act so that we can all look each other in the eye and say we are here because the American people and all of them elected us. I yield back. Gentleman yields back his time. What purpose does the gentle lady from New York seek recognition? The gentle lady asks for unanimous consent to address the House. Does the gentle lady ask for unanimous consent? I most certainly do. The gentle lady is recognized for one minute. Mr. Speaker, in just four days, millions of American students will quite finally find themselves between a rock and a hard place. Unless Congress acts, the interest rate on subsidized student loans will double on July 1st. This increase comes on top of sharp rises in public college tuition and together means that students hoping to improve their economic chances in life have to borrow more money at higher costs to get an increasingly more expensive college education. A new report by the Joint Economic Committee, on which I serve as the ranking uh, Democrat on the House side, shows that two-thirds of our recent graduates now have student loan debt with an average balance of 27000 For someone just starting out in life, that is a mountain of debt, an average about 60% of their annual earnings. That means that two-thirds of our college graduates today are starting out in a pretty deep, big hole. The question for Congress is, are we going to just sit back and let them get into a deeper and bigger hole of debt? Uh, let's fix the student loan problem and get America moving again. Gentlelady's time has expired. What purpose does a gentleman from New York seek recognition? Mr. Speaker, I should end this sentence and address the body for one minute. The gentleman from New York is recognized for one minute. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. It took the Supreme Court to remind us that when our young people put their bodies in harm's way or even offer their lives for this great country, that notwithstanding their background, they don't do it for their color, for their race, for their family and community alone. They do it for these great United States, people who never met each other but do feel that under our constitutions, we are all brought together to respect each other's rights, and we have an outline for that belief that is called our Constitution. It seems to me that yesterday, the Supreme Court said that we are making progress in making certain that all Americans are not, have the right to vote, and that Negroes, as they were called in 1965, uh, have made great progress. But that was not what Lyndon Johnson said when he was advocating the 1965 Civil Rights Act. He said that no impediment should be put in the way of any person being denied the right to vote because of their race or color. I hope the Supreme Court will review this ruling. Thank you. Gentlemen, time has expired. What purpose does the gentleman from Texas seek recognition? The gentleman from Texas is recognized for one minute. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I rise today to thank Texas State Senator Wendy Davis from my hometown of Fort Worth, Texas, for leading a marathon filibuster and standing up for women and women's rights. For too long, we've seen the health care choices of women taken over by male politicians who are more concerned with furthering an ideology than advancing women's health. Instead of listening to women, Male dominance over women's health care decisions has drowned out the most important voice of all, the women who face their own reproductive health care choices. 
I believe reproductive choices are deeply personal in nature and should rest with the woman. I believe we should promote education, counseling, and provide women with support services they need, not restrict their medical choices. Thank you, Senator Wendy Davis, who stood up for Texas women across the state. The voice of women were heard all over the country in this debate last night in the Texas legislature, and Senator Davis fought hard and fought back against any efforts to greatly reduce and restrict women's health care, and she won. Thank you, Senator Davis, for your courageous fight and well-deserved victory. Our fight to protect women's health care is not over, and I look forward to fighting with you, a strong Texas woman. Time has expired. What purpose does a gentleman from New York seek recognition? The gentleman from New York is recognized for one minute. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I rise today to congratulate Fryhofer's Baking Company as it celebrates 100 years in business in New York's capital region. After a century of contributing to the local economy, Fryhofer's plans to mark this milestone by continuing to give back to our community. Over the next year, the Albany-based baking company will give away up to 40,000 loaves of bread to consumers and charitable organizations. What makes Fryhofer's a remarkable company is quite simple. It's people. At every level, the good work done by the Fryhofer's team makes us all proud, and that is why I am on this floor speaking today. Fryhofer's has always focused on how best to serve our community. On June 1st, the organization celebrated its 35th anniversary of the Fryhofer's Run for Women, one of the largest and most prestigious all-female 5K road races, which stresses community health and involvement. In New York, we are proud to count Fryhofer's among our many successful businesses that boost our community pride just as much as local economic development. I congratulate Fryhofer's Baking Company on its first century of success and wish them many, many more years of fine baking to come. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. With that, I yield back. The gentleman yields back his time. What purpose does the gentlelady from Florida seek recognition? I seek unanimous consent to address the chair for one minute. The gentlelady from Florida is recognized for one minute. Mr. Speaker, it's now been 906 days since I arrived in Congress, and the Republican leadership has still not allowed a single vote on serious legislation to address our unemployment crisis. 37% of unemployed Americans have been without work for more than six months. That's 4.4 million people who haven't worked for at least a half year. Take a moment to imagine life without a job for six months. Imagine depleting your retirement savings to pay for your family's food and shelter. Imagine the pain of facing rejection again and again. As researchers around the nation have demonstrated, employers simply do not want to hire the long-term unemployed. There's a stigma. Workers just can't shake. It's up to Congress to take action. It's time for us to focus on retraining and reemployment programs to ensure that we stop the establishment of a permanent underclass in America. The mantra of this Congress should be jobs, jobs, jobs. Gentlelady, this time has expired. What purpose does the gentleman from Rhode Island seek recognition? Mr. Speaker, I ask the Senator address the House for one minute. The gentleman from Rhode Island is recognized. Mr. Speaker, early this week I hosted Democratic leader Nancy Pelosi for a roundtable discussion at America's number one art and design school, the Rhode Island School of Design. It focused on creating jobs and the opportunities that exist at the intersection of innovation, technology, and design. Rhode Island is the birthplace of the American Industrial Revolution, and we know that on a level playing field, American workers can compete against any international competitors. And that's why it's so critical that our country begin taking concrete steps to leverage these new opportunities. First, we need to better integrate curriculums on science, technology, engineering, mathematics, and art and design. Second, we need to think about using new tools, such as my Make it in America Manufacturing Act, to create manufacturing and innovation jobs right here in America, especially with the emerging opportunities in advanced manufacturing and 3D printing. And finally, we need to ensure that innovators and entrepreneurs have access to the capital they need to pursue their ideas without obstacles. 
I will continue working with my colleagues to make these goals a reality and keep our country at the cutting edge of innovation, technology, and design. I thank you, Mr. Speaker, and yield back the balance of my time. The gentleman yields back his time. What purpose does the gentlelady from California seek recognition? Mr. Speaker, she for one minute. Gentlelady is recognized for one minute. Mr. Speaker, I rise today to urge my colleagues to address the increase in student loans that is about to happen this week. If we do not do something by July 1st, the interest rate on student loans, which has been at 3.4 percent, will double to 6.8 percent. Now, last year we were able to come together and make an accord and make it easier for our students to gulp and take those loans out so that they could go and get an education. Getting an education, teaching our young people science, technology, engineering, mathematics, the arts, music, etc., is of national security interest to this nation. Even Secretary Gates said the number one issue is for our people to be educated. So we must show our students that we care about them and that they too have a future in this nation. I urge my colleagues to come together to do something about the student loans. Thank you. The gentlelady yields back her time. What purpose does the gentlelady from California seek recognition? The gentlelady is recognized for one minute. My remarks. Mr. Speaker, with just five days left until the student loan interest rates double, Congress must ask now, if we do not, student loan interest rates will double overnight from 3.4 percent to 6.8 percent. This will increase the cost of college for more than 7 million students across this nation and on the central coast of California adding thousands of dollars to a student college bill. And this will not only saddle students with more debt, but it will hinder our growing economy. At a time when the cost of college continues to rise, we must do all that we can to make college as affordable as possible for as many students as possible. We must keep open the doors of opportunity for all, and in the process, produce a well-educated workforce that will grow our economy. That's why I'm a proud supporter of legislation to keep the student rates at a low 3.4 percent. This legislation should be brought to this House floor for a vote immediately. Mr. Speaker, interest rates in other sectors remain low to help grow the economy. Why shouldn't they remain low for our students? They are our future. I yield back. Yields back her time. purpose does the gentleman from Utah seek recognition? Mr. Speaker, by direction of the Committee on Rules, I call up House Resolution 247 and ask for its immediate consideration. The clerk will report the resolution. House Calendar Number 35, House Resolution 274. Resolved that upon the adoption of this resolution it shall be in order to consider in the House the bill H.R. 1613 to amend the Outer Continental Shelf Lands Act to provide for the proper federal management and oversight of transboundary hydrocarbon reservoirs and for other purposes. All points of order against consideration of the bill are waived. The amendment in the nature of a substitute recommended by the Committee on Natural Resources now printed in the bill shall be considered as adopted. The bill as amended shall be considered as read. All points of order against provisions in the bill as amended are waived. The previous question shall be considered as ordered on the bill as amended and on any further amendment thereto to final passage without intervening motion except one. One hour of debate equally divided and controlled by the chair and ranking minority member of the Committee on Natural Resources. Two. 
the further amendment printed in Part A of the report of the Committee on Rules accompanying this resolution, if offered by Representative Grayson of Florida or his designee, which shall be in order without intervention of any point of order, shall be considered as read, shall be separately debatable for 10 minutes, equally divided and controlled by the proponent and an opponent, and shall not be subject to a demand for division of the question, and three, one motion to recommit with or without instructions. Section 2. At any time after the adoption of this resolution, the Speaker may, pursuant to Clause 2B of Rule 18, declare the House resolved to the Committee of the Whole House on the State of the Union for consideration of the Bill H.R. 2231 to amend the Outer Continental Shelf Lands Act to increase energy exploration and production of the Outer Continental Shelf provide for equitable revenue sharing for all coastal states, implement the reorganization of the functions of the former Minerals Management Service into distinct and separate agencies and for other purposes. The first reading of the bill shall be dispensed with. All points of order against consideration of the bill are waived. General debate shall be confined to the bill and shall not exceed one hour equally divided and controlled by the chair and ranking minority member of the Committee on Natural Resources. After general debate, the bill shall be considered for amendment under the five-minute rule. In lieu of the amendment in the nature of a substitute recommended by the Committee on Natural Resources now printed in the bill, it shall be in order to consider as an original bill for the purpose of amendment under the five-minute rule an amendment in the nature of a substitute consisting of the text of Rules Committee print 113-16. That amendment in the nature of a substitute shall be considered as read. All points of order against that amendment in the nature of a substitute are waived. No amendment to that amendment in the nature of a substitute shall be in order except those printed in Part B of the report of the Committee on Rules accompanying this resolution. Each such amendment may be offered only in the order printed in the report, may be offered only by a member designated in the report, shall be considered as read, shall be debatable for the time specified in the report, equally divided and controlled by the proponent and an opponent, shall not be subject to amendment, and shall not be subject to a demand for division of the question in the House or in the Committee of the Whole. All points of order against such amendments are waived. At the conclusion of consideration of the bill for amendment, the committee shall rise and report the bill to the House with such amendments as may have been adopted. Any member may demand a separate vote in the House on any amendment adopted in the Committee of the Whole to the bill or to the amendment in the nature of a substitute made in order as original text. The previous question shall be considered as ordered on the bill and amendments thereto to final passage without intervening motion except one motion to recommit with or without instructions. Section 3. At any time after the adoption of this resolution, the Speaker may, pursuant to Clause 2B of Rule 18, declare the House resolved into the Committee of the Whole House on the State of the Union for consideration of the Bill, H.R. 2410, making appropriations for agriculture, rural development, food and drug administration, and related agencies' programs for fiscal year ending September 30, 2014, and for other purposes. The first reading of the bill shall be dispensed with. All points of order against consideration of the bill are waived. General debate shall be confined to the bill and shall not exceed one hour equally divided and controlled by the chair and ranking minority member of the Committee on Appropriations. After general debate, the bill shall be considered for amendment under the five-minute rule. Points of order against provisions in the bill for failure to comply with Clause 2 of Rule 21 are waived, except as follows. Section 717. Section 718, the words, or any other, on page 64, line 13, the words, or any other, on page 65, line 9, and section 740, where points of order are waived against part of a section, points of order against a provision, and another part of such section may be made only against such provision and not against the entire section. During consideration of the bill for amendment, the chair of the Committee of the Whole may accord priority and recognition on the basis of whether the member offering an amendment has caused it to be printed in the portion of the Congressional record designated for that purpose in Clause 8 of Rule 18. Amendments so printed may be considered as read. When the Committee rises and reports the bill back to the House with a recommendation that the bill do pass, the previous question shall be considered as ordered on the bill and amendments thereto to final passage without intervening motion, except one motion to recommit with or without instructions. 
Section 4, on any legislative day during the period from June 29, 2013 through July 5, 2013, a. The journal of the proceedings of the previous day shall be considered as approved. And B. The chair may at any time declare the House adjourned to meet at a date and time within the limits of Clause 4, Section 5, Article 1 of the Constitution to be announced by the chair in declaring the adjournment. Section 5. The Speaker may appoint members to perform the duties of the chair for the duration of the period addressed by Section 4 of this resolution as though under Clause 8A of Rule 1. Section 6, it shall be in order without intervention of any point of order cons to consider concurrent resolutions providing for adjournment during the month of July. Section 7, the Committee on Appropriations may at any time before 6 p.m. on Wednesday, July 3, 2013, file privilege reports to accompany measures making appropriations for the fiscal year ending September 30, 2014. The gentleman from Utah is recognized for one hour. Mr. Speaker, for the purpose of debate only, I yield the customary 30 minutes to the gentleman from Florida, our good friend Mr. Hastings, who I certainly hope is feeling better than the way he's walking today. Pending that, I yield myself as much time as I may consume. The gentleman is recognized for as much time as he wishes to consume. Thank you. During the consideration of this resolution, all time is yielded for the purpose of debate only. I would also further ask that all members have five legislative days during which they may revise and extend their remarks. Without objection. This resolution provides for a structured rule for the consideration of H.R. 2231, the Offshore Energy and Jobs Act, as well as H.R. 1613, the Outer Continental Shelf Transboundary Hydrocarbon Agreements Authorization Act and make several specific rec amendments in order to each bill which were germane and compliant with the rules of the House. This proposed rule also provides for an open rule for consideration of H.R. 2410, the Agricultural Rural Development Food and Drug Administration and related agencies. Now, these energy bills, if enacted, will help foster responsible development of our abundant offshore domestic energy resources and will do so in an environmentally responsible manner. 2231 would help re reverse some of the current administration's energy policies, which are stalling responsible offshore lease development on the outer continental shelf. Legislation will require the administration to implement a new five-year leasing plan, including 50% of the areas that have been previously identified as the most promising in oil reserves and natural gas. Like the average American consumer has seen their energy bills since this administration started double. A gallon of gas was under $2 when uh, the president was first sworn in, and it's now routinely more than $4 a gallon and continues to climb. And yet the administration deliberately stalls and blocks job-creating, energy-producing projects, everything from Keystone Pipeline to responsible development of tar sands and reserves that we have on our public lands, including my own state. This actually hits the middle class and the poorer class the worst. H.R. 2231 will streamline the current bureaucracy handling these leases, will implement a fair and equitable revenue sharing plan for coastal states. Congressional Budget Office has indicated the passage of this bill would also reduce the net direct spending of the federal government by, one, by $1.5 billion over the next 10 years. So in essence, you have a bill that makes us more energy independent, drives down the cost of fuel for U.S. families, uh, helps reduce the cost of the federal government and produces an estimated 1.2 million new jobs. I think by most standards that would be considered a fairly good bill. Likewise, the other bill in the rule, in the rule 1613, the Outer Continental Shelf Transboundary Hydrocarbon Agreements Authorization Act, will provide for improved federal management and oversight of energy resources which straddle international boundaries. Passage of this act will implement an agreement we already have with the government of Mexico on how to handle development of these resources, including revenue sharing concepts, as well as ensuring that the United States companies who are investing will develop their resources but not be imperiled by actions that may be taken later on by the government. Finally, the resolution also provides for a modified open rule for consideration of H.R. 2410, the fiscal year 2014 Agricultural Rural Development, Food and Drug Administration and Related Agencies Appropriation Bill. 
which continues what was common when I first arrived here and then stopped but then reinstated and continues to be reinstated by Chairman Pete Sessions of having open rules on our appropriation bills. I'm appreciative of the Rules Committee Chairman's leadership in this regard. I'm also appreciative of the hard work and dedication of the bill's sponsors. First, the gentleman from South Carolina, Mr. Duncan, the gentleman from Washington and also chairman of the House Natural Resources Committee, Mr. Hastings, as well as the gentleman from Alabama, Mr. Adderholt, for his leadership on the Agriculture Appropriation Bill. In short, this is a fair and good rule dealing with good pieces of legislation. And Mr. Speaker, these are good bills. I urge their adoption, and I reserve the balance of my time. The gentleman from Utah reserves his time. The gentleman from Florida is recognized. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And I thank the gentleman from Utah, my friend, Mr. Bishop, for yielding the customary 30 minutes to me. This rule provides for the consideration of three bills as enunciated uh, by my uh, our friend from Utah. However, the only thing that these bills have in common is that they are overwhelmingly partisan in nature and fail to address the most pressing challenges facing our country. Bottom line, we should be doing all that we can to help struggling Americans get back on their feet. The first bill, H.R. 1613, had been relatively non-controversial and could have been addressed under suspension, but instead, my colleagues on the other side of the aisle have chosen to take the partisan route by including a provision that waives the Securities and Exchange Commission Natural Resources Extraction Disclosure Rule of the Dodd-Frank Consumer Protection Act, which requires the disclosure of payments from oil and gas companies to foreign governments. I just simply don't understand why this poison pill was uh, added. Similarly, H.R. 2231 opens up new unsafe drilling off the coast of 14 states at a time when domestic energy production is booming. Furthermore, the bill does virtually nothing. And I ask that question of, of our colleague, Mr. Duncan, from South Carolina to implement key safety reforms in the wake of the BP Deepwater Horizon disaster and constrains the statutory review process for offshore uh, drilling. This is a part of the Republicans' drill, baby, drill energy policy agenda. While my colleagues on the other side of the aisle continue to bring bills like this to the floor, which contain huge giveaways to big oil, it is clear that they are not interested in doing a thing to protect worker safety, the environment, or the tourism and fishing industries. It is astounding that Congress would move forward to open new natural gas and oil leases when the institution has not acted on the recommendations to improve the safety of offshore drilling. If we didn't learn anything at all from BP, we ain't ever going to learn anything. The successor to the BP spill commission recently gave Congress a D-plus grade on its legislative response to the spill. Before opening any new leases, we should enact legislation to improve safety and eliminate or adjust the liability caps upwards. We have a pitiable liability cap now of uh, 75 um, a million. It is time to get real about energy policy. We need to invest in the development of renewable resources, which would reduce our impact on climate change and move us towards true energy independence. These two bills today aren't about gas, prices, or job creation. They're about bolstering the Republicans' political base and lining the pockets of big oil and gas CEOs. Um, Republicans refuse to address the sequester and insistence upon limited cuts in the Homeland Security, MILCON, VA, and DOD appropriations bills leave all the other non-defense measures like H.R. 2410 before us today with inadequate funding levels. 
their refusal, my friends on the other side, to appoint conferees to reach a bipartisan compromise on the budget and end the sequester has left us with the, this disastrous agriculture bill that we saw last week. As my Republican colleagues very well know, there are $214 million in cuts to women, infants, and children, WIC funding, which will prevent 214,000 eligible applicants from receiving the nutrition uh, they need. Furthermore, there are $284 uh, million in cuts to Food for Peace that will result in 7.4 million fewer people receiving food aid from the United States. Mr. Speaker, I'd really laugh except the prioritization uh, of, uh, of uh, partisanship and politics over responsibility has become par for the course in the Republican-controlled Congress. As I pointed out before, just last week, the Republican partisan uh, 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 farm bill uh, uh, was scuttled. Uh, traditionally, I'm here now 21 years, and that bill, at times uh, that it was brought appropriately, was a bipartisan piece of legislation. Draconian cuts and work requirements imposed upon programs that benefit the poorest among us effectively kill any chance of the farm bill passing. Rather than see passage of a strong bipartisan bill, Republicans deliberately made it unpalatable to even strong agriculture supporters like myself. These are not the priorities of a nation that cares about its poor. These are the priorities of a Republican Party that cares only about itself. The poor are not villains. Many are trapped in inescapable situations due to circumstances totally beyond their control and largely in many instances by our making here in this institution. Mr. Speaker, it's hard to pull yourself up by your bootstraps when those bootstraps without any nourishment may be the only thing you have to eat. I reserve the balance of my time. The gentleman from Florida reserves. The gentleman from Utah is recognized. I am happy to yield um, four minutes to the author of one of the bills in here, as well as the chairman of the Natural Resource Committee, the gentleman from Washington, Mr. Hastings. The gentleman from Washington is recognized for four minutes. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chair Mr. Speaker, and I thank the uh, gentleman for yielding time. And I rise in a strong support of the rule and the underlying legislation covered by the rule. Mr. Speaker, in our country today, millions of Americans continue to search for work. The national average price of gasoline is $3.50 a gallon, and rising costs of everything from electricity to food to health care makes it tough for families and small businesses to make ends meet. But instead of providing relief for struggling Americans, President Obama yesterday announced a plan that will inflict further pain and cause further damage to our struggling economy. The President's latest attempt to unilaterally impose a national energy tax will cost American jobs and will increase energy prices. Now, in stark contrast to that, Mr. Speaker, Republicans are advancing solutions to expand access to affordable energy in order to create jobs and to lower energy costs. The bills the House are considering this, this week are necessary because the Obama administration's persistent and destructive attacks on American energy production. The President's latest efforts to impose new energy taxes and government red tape follow four and a half years of erecting American energy roadblocks. H.R. 2231, the Offshore Energy and Jobs Act, will unlock our offshore energy resources that are being held captive by this administration. The differences are clear between the President's current no new drilling and no new jobs plan and the Republican pro-energy, pro-jobs offshore drilling plan. The President's recent five-year current offshore leasing plan keeps 85% of offshore areas under lock and key. Mr. Speaker, keeps 85% under lock and key. That effectively reinstates the moratoria that were, was, was off before he took office. The Republican Drill Smart Plan would open new areas containing the most oil and natural gas resources, allowing the new energy production in parts of the Atlantic 
and the Pacific Coast. The President's plan refuses even to let Virginia develop its offshore resources until after 2017. And it canceled a lease sale that would have allowed them to, to uh, uh, go offshore two years ago. The Republican plan supports the bipartisan w wishes of the Virginia governor, the congressional delegation, and the public by requiring an offshore lease sale to be held. The president's plan suppresses American job creation and economic growth. Our plan, Mr. Speaker, in contrast, would create 1.2 million jobs long term and would create $1.5 billion in new revenue. This Republican approach is exactly what our country and our economy needs right now. We can do better than what the President outlined yesterday that stifles American energy production and raises energy costs. I urge adoption of the rule and the underlying the legislation. With that, I yield back my time to the gentleman from Utah. I gentleman from Washington yields back his time. Gentleman from Florida is recognized. I would say to my very good friend and namesake, if you can do better, do it. Uh, I'm very pleased at this time to yield three minutes to my, my distinguished colleague with whom I, I serve on the Rules Committee from Massachusetts, uh, Mr. McGovern. Gentleman from Massachusetts recognized for three minutes. Mr. Speaker, last week uh, the Farm Bill failed. It failed in large part because of uh, Republicans' nasty attacks on, uh, on America's nutrition and anti-hunger programs. And notwithstanding uh, the experience of last week, uh, in this rule, the House is considering debating the Agriculture Appropriations Bill, a bill that not only underfunds the WIC program, but actually makes it more difficult for low-income women to receive breastfeeding counseling. Mr. Speaker, it's as if the Republican leadership hasn't learned from its mistakes. WIC is a critical program that provides food and nutrition counseling for low-income pregnant and breastfeeding women, as well as for newborns and infants. It is an important and successful program. It is a key program that helps pregnant and breastfeeding women stay healthy through proper nutrition and actually helps prevent many health issues associated with poor nutrition. Despite the program's 39-year successful track record, the Republicans decided to include WIC in their sequester plan, unlike SNAP, which thankfully was excluded from the sequester and every single major deficit reduction plan, the WIC program was subjected to the sequester and the FY 2014 Agriculture Appropriations Bill includes a major cut to the WIC program. The cuts to WIC in this bill could result in over 200,000 pregnant mothers and infants losing access to nutritious food. And tapping into the reserve and tapping into the reserve fund uh, isn't going to uh, cover everyone. 55,000 moms and kids will go without the nutrition that they need. And WIC is so severely underfunded that the breastfeeding counseling program, a cornerstone of this program, is zeroed out. Now, I guess I shouldn't be surprised that this House of Representatives would promote such anti-women, anti-mother, anti-child legislation. After all, this is the same House that allowed an all-male Republican majority in the Judiciary Committee to write and, uh, and promote legislation that attacked a woman's right to, to choose. Uh, and by the way, President Obama is threatening a veto uh, of the Agricultural Appropriations Bill in large part because of this, these draconian cuts. I would say to my Republican friends, stop your assault against poor people in this country. Now, uh, this Agriculture Appropriations Bill would be bad enough on its own. It would be better if the Appropriations Committee would redraft the bill at pre-sequester funding levels so we're not forced to choose between programs like food safety and WIC, for example. But what is, uh, what is particularly egregious about this rule uh, that we're considering is what is not included. And what's not included is a fix to the up upcoming doubling of the student loan interest rates. Congress is going to leave for the 4th of July recess on Friday, yet interest rates are scheduled to double if Congress doesn't act before July 1st. We need an immediate fix to this problem, but instead of working to prevent penalizing millions of students who are looking for help paying for college, the Republican leadership is forcing the House to debate tired, retread bills like offshore drilling expansion that have no chance of becoming law. Instead of pushing legislation that helps banks and lenders make even more money, we ought to help the middle class, we ought to help our students. The gentleman from Florida reserves, the gentleman from Utah is recognized. I uh, appreciate the comments that were just made by the gentleman from Massachusetts. 
about a program which does fund $6.7 billion in the WIC program and was passed unanimously by voice vote from both parties in the Appropriations Committee. With that, I would yield three minutes to the uh, sponsor of one of the bills that is part of this rule, the gentleman from South Carolina, Mr. Dunk. The gentleman from South Carolina is recognized for three minutes. I thank the chairman. Um, I rise today in support of two of the bills that are under this rule, H.R. 1613, the Outer Continental Shelf Transboundary Hydrocarbon Agreement Authorization Act, and H.R. 2231, the Offshore Energy and Jobs Act. You know, both these bills do three things. They provide for jobs, they provide for energy security, and they provide for national security. Let's put Americans to work harvesting the resources that we have here in this country, and let's meet our energy needs because, as Ad Admiral Mullen said, there can be no national security without energy security. Let me repeat that. There can be no national security without energy security. Let's open up these offshore areas that we have resources under, and let's produce American energy here at home, putting Americans to work to provide for our energy needs. I specifically uh, rise to talk about H.R. 1613, which implements the Obama administration's own agreement an agreement signed in Cabo by Secretary Clinton and uh, Foreign Minister Espinoza from Mexico that says, you know what, there are resources under that shared boundary out in the Gulf of Mexico, the boundary shared between the United States and the country of Mexico. Resources that can be explored and produced to meet our energy needs here at home, working with our southern neighbor, Mexico, to share those resources and share the revenues. And let's do it the right way. Let's do it with American safety standards, American environmental standards that are currently applied to American energy companies producing in the Gulf of Mexico. Let's require those Mexican companies to comply with those standards. And then let's share those revenues. This is the right thing. And HR. Um, 1613 will implement that agreement, but it will do something else. It will remove the uncertainty and provide for American competitiveness uh, when you're competing with foreign countries such as Mexico. This is the right thing for America. Put Americans to work, meet our energy needs, and meet our national security needs. That's why House Republicans have focused on an all of the above all American energy strategy, and uh, these bills are part of that. And with that, Mr. Chairman, I will yield back. Gentleman yields back. Gentleman from Utah Reserves. Gentleman from Florida is recognized. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I'm very pleased to yield two minutes to the distinguished gentlewoman from 